Hello, Brian. H hello, Haley, and hello, Jonathan Rotenberg. Uh, hey, Brian. We, oh, sorry, hey, Haley. No, no, sorry to no. Uh, uh, Haley, uh, Jonathan and I met in Provincetown, and I had heard about him, you know, before we met. I mean, he, he was the wonder kid. I mean, he just, he was on the front cover of, of uh, the Wall Street Journal at age 18. So I was in awe of Jonathan, but we became friends through meditation. Jonathan heard that Ray and I, you know, did meditation once a week, I think on the second floor overlooking the water and uh, people were welcome to come and Jonathan heard, asked, and he joined us. And that's how, you know, we became kind of, Buddha buddies. <laughs> <laughs> and we just discovered before we went on the air that uh, my spiritual guide is Francis of Assisi and Jonathan's spiritual guide is Francis of Assisi. So that's pretty cool. And I think just before that, Jonathan mentioned his goal. He said my goal, but both Brian and I took it as Michael. <laughs> and we're like, hello, Archangel Michael. <laughs> Yeah, that what well, Michael's sitting on your shoulder, Haley, <laughs> if you don't mind entertaining him in Mexico. Uh, but, he's with me a lot of the time, so. <laughs> so let me just let me just say a couple of things about my friend Jonathan. One, uh, uh, he Steve Jobs took uh, Jonathan under wing um, when Jonathan was just a, I think, teenager, eighteen, mm -hmm. and 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 he was uh, Jonathan's spiritual guide for for from that moment until his death and uh and and jonathan as brilliant as he is in computer science went and got a degree in social work because he wanted to be of good use to people one-on-one -on -one, right mm -hmm. and uh it, i think he's on a hero's journey extraordinary mm -hmm. hero's journey where he's trying to take a look at spirituality and see if the paradigm doesn't need to shift. Am I right, Jonathan? Oh, I um, I think the paradigm is right. It's just I think we don't quite get it yet. Let's say more. Yeah. Uh, Could you start, slide? Jonathan, yeah. possibly by explaining your perspective of the paradigm? Because immediately when you say, when the word paradigm comes up, I'm like, what are we talking about? Well, also, I don't mean to interrupt if there was like no. more things you wanted to gloat about uh, about me. But uh, <laughs> um, so, well, all right. So, what is the paradigm? Maybe Brian should say what you meant by that. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, uh, the paradigm is acknowledging uh, that all sentient beings are connected as one organism and that we are we are we all have divine divinity um within us we don't need to pray to an outside source you know uh we we have within ourselves the capacity to understand what it is we're supposed to understand if we just be quiet uh, ray and i watched the film last night um where the everyone kept praying to God to let me be a baseball player and let me get more people in my congregation. And I thought, wow, that's so different uh, from the way we see uh, spirituality or our relationship with the divine. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I um, agree 100% that, uh, I mean, this in Buddhism, um, there's one of the basic principles of Buddhism is called anatta, which means no self. Uh, and uh, the, this is really an underlying teaching of so much of Buddhism. And that is, oh, geez, sorry. Okay. This is just going to happen. Like the moment. Yes, it does. It's yeah, January. Like, it's January. Uh, this has been happening all month. So let's welcome <laughs> it and let's move on. <laughs> it's the universe saying, hi, I'm still here. Uh, it's like your puppy. Um, so, um, what, what that means is that we experience ourselves as being these solid fixed things. Like I am me, I am my thoughts. I will always be that way. But the reality is that's all an illusion. I mean, it literally is an illusion. If you think about what we've learned from quantum physics, that we're actually not solid objects. We are like, 
tiny part of a thimbleful of little quantum particles flying around really, really fast, creating the illusion of something that's here that, that really isn't. Um, so I uh, believe, who uh, you probably know, Brian, the French priest who said... Yeah, uh, well, it was the uh, actually the Peruvian uh, Father uh, Gutierrez. He said the gospel of liberation. Is that what you're thinking about? No, the one who said um, that we are not physical beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember where I heard it. Um, I, it's on I a lot of T-shirts right now. Is that? Oh yeah. It's very trendy. Yeah. So, um, so, so I agree with you completely that you know what you're saying aligns with the idea that we're not we're not who we think we are. There's something bigger and more uh, interesting going on. And uh, the other thing, Brian, you talked about is non-separation. That it is actually an illusion that we are these separate individuals uh, that at a much, much deeper level, uh, there is no separation. Um, and I, uh, I think that's very hard for a lot of people to understand. It's like, what, you know, um, and, and I think part of that is because there's often a battle, I believe that happens in spiritual circles, you know, between like, we have to be pragmatic and live in this real world, we have to clothe people and feed them and deal with the realities of life. But there's another part that says, um, uh, this is all a waste of time because we don't really exist. Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing that exists is love and is you know, harmony and that's where we should be. And um, I think both of these are probably true in themselves, but also limiting because the problem I have with the you know, it's only about love. Well, okay, does that mean if you just run in front of a speeding car, uh, you don't have anything to worry about because if you don't, you know, exist. The, the, all of this really comes down to, I'm maybe making it sound too complicated, but what I believe fundamentally is that the deeper truth is like everyone is right. Uh, and there are fundamentally two realities that exist at the same time. One is the physical reality that we all know and the other is the metaphysical and that there are um, a lot of things like I, I believe in God and I totally am great with people who are atheists. And I would actually in some way say that I think God is an atheist, uh, <laughs> which is interesting because I don't think God would accept like our ideas of God as this like, you know, white man in the sky. Um, so there are these two different realities, uh, and it's not that one is right and one is wrong, but in one reality, metaphysically, we are all one energy, one heart, one mind, but then we're also physically these separate uh, beings. Uh, and we're, and we just, I think that's what we're trying to sort out. And people are arguing over stuff where, I, I, I think if you look at most arguments about spirituality, if you step back, I, I would probably say, you know what, you're right, you're right. You're like the blind man and the elephant. You're, what you're seeing that you think is the whole thing is, is right, but it's actually part of a bigger thing. It's like you're, you're holding onto the leg and you're holding onto the ear uh, and you are arguing that the other person is completely wrong, but actually you really can't know this elephant, this universe, this life, whatever, without both of your experiences. So we actually need all religions and spiritual traditions to be listening to each other because they're all incomplete. That's sort of my bottom line. I want to come, like, we're going to circle all the way back to quantum physics and the paradigm. Uh -huh. I really wanted to sort of start, like, with you. And it feels like to me that this, the way that you think and the way that you see things was something that you kind of realized early on in life or had a different, did you have that awareness earlier on in life as a child that perhaps you see through, you see things a little bit differently? Um, this is an interesting question. I, I've definitely struggled a lot of my life with feeling different uh, that 
I don't understand people and they don't understand me. And it just seems like one disaster after another. <laughs> and it's like, I can't quite put my finger on what, like, what's the problem here. Um, but I had a, a very interesting experience in a silent meditation retreat about 10 years ago, um, in which uh, after about four days in silence, I came to meet versions of myself from way earlier in my life. And they were parts of me that were, were basically stuck uh, because of trauma and other reasons. Uh, and I, and I, I sort of came to face them. And they, what was interesting is they're different ages. So like the really young versions of me don't know English. Uh, and, and a lot of them are scared of me and, and want me to go away. Um, but so I have to find a way to communicate with them. And they each looked very different. Um, but this is uh, in answer to your question. I, um, I came to meet a version of myself that I called the star child. And this version of me was like maybe three years old and was wearing a silver spacesuit and had blonde hair. And basically uh, was just despondent. And what, what this version of me was saying is I was supposed to have gone to a civilized planet and I ended up in this hell <laughs> and I went out of here. <laughs> I'm laughing because I say that all the time that I have my compass is broken. Yeah. Like, it's just always going like, it's just always going in a different direction to where I think I should be going. Um, well, yeah, and it's like there's just something, there's some awareness that I seem to have arrived with from an early age. Um, I, uh, like as a, when we were four years old, I, we went on a family trip to Europe, and I guess I would just like notice like the color of the sky and things that, you know, seem perfectly interesting to me, but were kind of unusual for a four-year-old. Um, and then when I was in nursery school, um, my, my mother tells me that my teacher said that I kind of played the role of being like the conscience of the classroom. <clears throat> so like if people were doing things that weren't good, I would, you know, kind of speak up. But also some of the other kids that were very difficult that the teacher had a hard time with, I would like sit down and talk with them <laughs> as a four-year-old. Mm. Uh, so I, I, um, I think I, uh, I realized that I probably was already a social worker at the age of four, um, but it took me like another 50 years to actually mm -hmm. be okay with it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I identify with that, Jonathan. Uh, you know, visiting early v versions of Brian, uh, um, I went to a, a, a warrior weekend of the you know the iron john people and i was the only gay person and they had me do a role play of talking to myself as a child and i just bawled you know i you know i told him he was going to get fired i told him people people would call him faggot i told him that you know that uh, people would not want to be his friend and and um you know i just bawled uh uh, in terms of wanting to take care of them and wanting to protect them. But I said, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You're going to, mm -hmm. you're going to come out of this and you're going to be the b incredible. You're going to be just, you know, bigger than you can handle. <laughs> that's beautiful. I mean, that's the key to healing is that we really become, we parent ourselves and we mm -hmm. give ourselves the space, the compassion, just the loving tenderness, whatever is needed for that broken part of us to really restore what where it came from. Jonathan, Brian and I often talk about sort of the old soul concept and mm -hmm. sort of trying to figure out why some people are more resilient than others and why we sort of, some people seem like an old soul and it's like as early as childhood. And mm -hmm. you know, when you're talking immediately, I'm like, there's an old soul, a four-year-old counseling other kids, old souls. <laughs> 
what is your take on sort of that old soul and sort of have you kind of sat with yourself to kind of ask answer the question why me why as a four-year-old am I the one counseling other kids instead of you know being a regular four-year-old yeah so I have a little mixed feelings about the term old soul uh, I, I fully agree with what you're talking about but I guess, first of all, I think that all souls are the same age, uh, like that we all are, are coming from the same place. But I think we really take on different jobs uh, when we incarnate into this uh, human experience. Um, and what we talk about as old souls, my sense is that there's sort of like, mm, uh, I don't know if this is the right word. I'm thinking spiritual ambition. Like the, the older souls are taking on bigger and more difficult problems. And they are doing this through being very conscious about seeing each lifetime that they incarnate into as sort of raising the bar higher for themselves and trying to become of greater service to the ever evolving and world and the more complicated problems that keep getting worse. Um, so I, so um, one of the things that I feel when I talk to someone who's had a really tough life, uh, there's a very, very, very dear friend of mine who um, has a schizoaffective disorder, which is actually like about the worst kind of mental illness you can have because it is the combination of both Schiz uh, schizophrenia, which is brutal, and major depressive disorder. Um, and uh, this friend has had a brutal, brutal life. And so when I meet people like her and really others who just, it seems like life is so unfair and things have been so unfairly wrong, I feel, I feel like pretty sure that each of them are, are, are old souls in the sense that they picked to have a really hard and difficult life um, because they knew at some level that they were ready for it. Like they are in the advanced program. Now to say that someone with a severe mental illness could sound really cruel. Like you're saying, you know, that I, I chose to have this horrific illness that's destroyed my life. But it's funny, no one has ever had that response. When I say that there's actually and literally this friend of mine was like, really? I'm like, yeah. And I think everything is necessary, like for reasons that like somehow your soul knows that are like not accessible to us. But I, I kind of look at, um, you know, adversity and the worst things that happen in our life is kind of like the chisel and the hammer of the universe that like this is awful but you have to have this experience in order to break off the piece that's going to create the you know the beautiful skin uh underneath um so so net net i would say yeah these are i guess the term i would like i would prefer would be souls on the advanced program uh people that have chosen brutally difficult lives um that have an agenda which maybe they don't know but one of the things that I feel as sort of spiritual counselors, you know, we can help people to um, ask the question, like, why would all of this be happening? Like, or let's just say hypothetically, um, if I had some really amazing vision of what I could be or what I could become, like, why, why would I purposely choose to have the life that I'm having. I haven't done this widely because I'm very afraid that most people would be like, that's absolutely cruel and awful of you to ask that question because you're minimizing the experience and you don't understand how awful it is. Uh, so I'm kind of cautious. Uh, and in fact, people will probably write angry responses to this. Like, how dare you <laughs> say that people would choose? Um, but I do think that's all gets to, you know, these two different parallel realities. In the physical realm, of course, no one physically would choose to suffer. But the spiritual metaphysical is so much more mysterious. 
Um, and sometimes um, what we think of as really awful may not may actually be good, and what we think of as good may be awful. And that's, I guess, that's sort of how I think about it. You know, to add what you're saying, Jonathan, in my work, I work with and I counsel and guide people that have gone through awful things that other humans do to other humans. And mm. in my experience and speaking directly with these people, they have an awareness or an opening of being able to accept that perhaps I've chosen this and it means something. Yeah. Find that other people outside of it have no exception acceptance of that concept. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's far easier for me to have that conversation and to sort of turn the sessions into why do you think you chose this? What do you think you're getting out of it? Mm. It's much easier for me to have that conversation with my client than for me to have that conversation with somebody I'm having coffee with. Yeah. Or, or the conversation with yourself. Right. And I think it is me having the conversation with myself and obviously dealing just to what you're saying. You know, we think it's awful, but then we get through it, we get to the other side and we're like, oh, I can see why that was necessary, even though yeah. it's not fantastic. It's my experience of going through that and having, again, that weird openness, that resilience, that acceptance to be able to ask the question, why would I choose this? Where well, is my soul going with this? Something, you know, when you talk about the people you have coffee with, um, I think an interesting question would be, all right, if that's what an old soul or an advanced soul or something is, like, what would be the absolute opposite of that? And in my view, the opposite is someone for whom all of the rules and guidelines of conventional society work beautifully mm -hmm. so i just i follow all the rules of my religion i get rewarded i'm a good religious person i you know i meet the uh homecoming queen or king and um i i'm like the perfect accountant i get the perfect job and i cannot imagine like why do people struggle so much you know mm -hmm. if you just follow the rules everything works beautifully and um, so without naming names, there are some people that I'm, I'm very close to in my life that I would say, like, have never known suffering. They, like, they really, really don't firsthand know what, like, profound, profound suffering is. Um, and interestingly, I just find pretty commonly, um, like, just this mystery, like society, everything is designed so perfectly. If you stop trying to be such a rebel and just obey the rules, you know, life is great. Um, and um, we as spiritual people could kind of poo poo, uh, you know, well, they're not, they're like young souls and they don't really get it. But actually like it takes, you know, when I think about this as a management consultant in an organization, you need so many different kinds of people. And like in a human body, you need so many different kinds of cells and organs. And like, if we didn't have people having easy lives, uh, we would be in big trouble. So I think we have to not look at them as a problem, but really embrace them as like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you have an easy life because you've been able to tolerate me <laughs> in all of my crises uh, and not you know, get triggered by it. Um, or or not. I mean, uh, some of the people that you're talking about uh, who follow the rules, they're straight, they're white, they go to college, they get a job, they are at the country club. Um, you know, I'm, I, I love how you're putting this, Jonathan, but a lot, a lot of those people are the ones who say, um, you know, the three of us are wacky and, and, uh, you know, you're taking up airtime, get out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, sure, I, I, a fascinating thing you said. Um, today, Ray and I talked with the guy who cleans our pool. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he happened to have won, just wanted a dance competition. Mm -hmm. And when we came in, we both said, he's an old soul. Mm -hmm. right? uh, for me, an old soul is a person who is wise beyond their years. Mm, yeah. uh, 
uh, who, you know, we could all three describe him or her as the person who preferred to be around adults, uh, the person who, you know, wanted to read things others didn't, uh, you know, want to read or, uh, and the person that is, stands out like you, Jonathan, uh, taking care of the kids in school. I had the same reputation, you know, <laughs> as the helper. But if if I can, if we pick out some people's old souls and we say that all of us are the same soul, mm. right? How how does that work? Uh, you know, I've I've sort of thought that when a a, a person who has made trouble their whole life dies mm -hmm. and they're absorbed into back into the soul the being mm -hmm. um uh, th those who have done good in their life get absorbed and 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 negate their negative influence on the big soul you know um now uh, we we're all crude you know in our understanding of of reality you know people will laugh at some of this in a hundred years but um i do agree with you that every religion is an attempt to to do the same thing mm -hmm. uh, to walk home right well in terms of like oh i just want to just add one other thing i don't know if you this is something that you find but something that i've noticed about what your you know people that you're calling old souls is that they seem to be in a rush uh, in life, like to get started at a very young age, doing whatever they're doing, and they seem to be often precocious. Uh, mm -hmm. But in your question of like, okay, how can we all be the same soul but end up so differently? I was thinking of an analogy might be, um, you know, if we're a human body, like how can we all be the same cells, but some of us are like a heart and some of us are a knee, you know, like, we're made of the same stuff, but but we we play very different roles. And I, I also, you know, you mentioned about like uh, literally bad people in life uh, versus good people, um, and I've never quite been able to sort of make sense out of like let's say someone like Adolf Hitler, where you there's just no way you can argue that there's some redeeming quality there. Uh, so that's I, there's a whole realm of this that I'm still not sure about. But I've really found that from whatever what my soul's plan was, um, that the people in my life who strike me as the most evil, like truly like cruel, hideous, ruthless, I am realizing are my teachers. <laughs> Not only that, I. I have come to believe this crazy idea that we knew each other uh, before I was born and the most hideous, awful things uh, they're doing, they're doing at my request. And I'll say, um, some, some, and reveal something very vulnerable and embarrassing. Um, I had a very successful career as a management consultant. I gave up all that, went back to school to get a master's in social work and really feel like, wow, I, um, I'm so glad that I waited till later in life to do the social work degree because I now can bring so much more. And I feel like I am, um, I just, I've never loved work so much. And I feel like such a uh, profound connection with clients and working primarily with homeless people. Um, and what I think they would find really different about me is I don't see them as a homeless person. I see them as a human being with extraordinary potential. And we don't need to, I mean, we need to be practical and help them with clothing and whatever. But what we also need to do is like reconnect with like, what is it that brings you alive? And what's, you know, what do we want to make of this? Uh, so I am uh, just loving this clinical social work and I end up getting fired. Uh, but not just fired once, I get fired three times in a row, but not in sort of like the universe sort of set this up. So it wasn't just like, oh, you know, we're just laying people off because of staffing. It was like the most humiliating, like dramatically humiliating, <laughs> cruel, like 
unfair, unjust uh, thing, like, imaginable. And I've, um, I have developed a system, and I don't know if this is something that is very personal to me or if this works more broadly for other people who are on a spiritual path and who are experiencing unusual mystical experiences. What I figured out for me is that if something awful is happening, if it's not just awful, but it's like crazy awful, and then ridiculously crazy awful, and then like so insanely awful that there's only one way you can look at it is you have to laugh. It's just over the top to the point that it's comical. That I've learned is the universe kind of winking, like don't take this personally, this is your, this is your chiseling. And so I think about like the cruelty and inhumanity of how people have taught me and suddenly I'm thinking, oh my God, I bet this awful boss was my best friend back, you know, in the metaphysical realm. And I bet I said, you know, uh, listen, I'm going to be in this job in 2023 and I really need your help with something. I, I need you to fire me, but not just fire me. You have to make it like so humiliating that it just destroys my ego and nothing less than that is going to work. And I can imagine the person saying, oh, but Jonathan, you're such a nice guy. I don't want to do that. And I'm like, no, I, I, I know I, I'm not, I know this is not something pleasant, but if you could just do it as a favor for me, I would be so grateful. Uh, <laughs> and that's how I, like, I understand all of this. Yeah. I tend to agree, you know, in my personal life, I tend to agree with that too. You know, I think we all have, I firmly believe my truth is reincarnation. And I think we have, this wonderful spiritual thing, both, you know, physical human beings and guides that were like, all right, this is what I'm planning to do. And they're like, all right, <laughs> are you sure? And we agree to it and we do it. And I think that they're there when we start to question going like, what am I doing and why? And I can't go on anymore. I firmly believe in that. And, you know, when it comes to trying to understand sort of the evil in our personal lives and the evil in the world, for me, it goes back to the example you gave of the elephant. The elephant is love. We're just holding on to different spectrums of love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Hitler, I, I firmly believe that Hitler was acting from a place of love. Mm -hmm. It was just a love that was so profound and deep on one side of the spectrum mm -hmm. that I would sit on my side of the spectrum and be like, Dude, how you're acting that out isn't quite love to the rest of the world. You might be receiving, you know, safety and your people might be receiving comfort and safety, but it's not looking like love, dude. Interesting. So I yeah. think it's, you know, I think, again, being able to sort of ask that question, and have the acceptance of maybe love is the answer to everything. If we all come from love, then love is the answer to everything. So I actually, I have... I've lost it, but I usually have in front of me four letters, W, W, L, D. What would love do? Any situation, no matter what, I just go back to W, W, L, D. What would love do? And I really think it's, it, I totally agree it's the answer to every, every problem. I wanted to, you know, and speaking about sort of cruel and the different people in our lives, you had an amazing experience of your life leading you to Steve Jobs, who in our lifetime is probably one of the greatest pioneers of technology. But there are some people that would view him as changing the world for the worse. And there are some people that would view him as sort of this spiritual enlightened being that perhaps brought technology to us that we so needed at this point in time. From your perspective, how do you view the soul Steve Jobs in your life? Hmm. Um, I figure out, there's so many ways of kind of cutting into this. And I have to just start by saying that I, I've been working for 12 years on a book, uh, which is called My Teacher Steve Jobs. The title is actually comes from a Tibetan a book of Tibetan teachings called The Words of My Perfect Teacher. And I am really in the name kind of expressing a certain reverence uh, to someone who 
I consider to be one of the greatest teachers of my life. Um, now, how many people have said, oh, I am so interested to hear about Steve Jobs' spiritual path and like what a great guy he was. Um, absolutely no one has said that. Uh, instead, um, you know, pretty consistently, I, I well, let me start by saying the whole premise of the book, um, I watched a panel discussion on a, like live stream video from a conference in California with Steve Jobs's college, uh, not roommate, but friend who like they developed the idea together to go to India and they were, they were sort of these spiritual journey mates. And this guy is being um, interviewed on this panel and someone says, you know, or I think he says, and yeah, and have you heard that Jonathan Rotenberg is writing this book about Steve Jobs being a Buddhist teacher? Is that like, the most like insane, sick thing you've ever heard. Like he's nothing, you know, whatever. So people uh, don't accept the premise <laughs> that Steve was a spiritual teacher and they have such strong feelings of him as a, um, just a, a ruthless, ruthless corporate CEO who drove people to terrible harm and, uh, you know, created all this technology. So, um, I just sort of say that because this is like, I, I'm struggling with this and I have been for years in terms of like uh, how to explain this. And the way that the book works is that it doesn't, I'm really careful not to try to convince you of anything about Steve or about me, but the book is actually, is a series of experiences of from my life, from Steve's life, from things that happened together that actually form kind of a, mystery adventure um, of, first of all, the most bizarre thing is like, how does an 18 year old end up meeting his life idol, <laughs> hero? I mean, I, Steve Jobs to me would be like, um, you know, Marilyn Monroe or, um, you know, Mick Jagger or something. Uh, who ever thinks that you would, um, you know, if there was someone that was that significant to you that you would meet and and I'm 18 years old and I and I'm able to get Steve Jobs to come to Boston for an event I was organizing and I'm just blown away by him he looks he, he's 26 years old he looks to me like a like like a favorite summer camp counselor who's like you know just he's charismatic he's charming he is brilliant he's philosophical he's very funny um, and he's also gone from being a um, basically a monastic ascetic. He like has no furniture. Uh, he likes to be shoeless. He walks five miles on Sundays to get a hot meal at the Hare Krishna temple. This this ascetic now five years later at the age of twenty six has just had the most successful initial public stock offering in American history since the Ford Motor Company. This 26 year old is worth $250 million, uh, which would be like $2 billion today. Uh, and something crazy happened. So the first thing that's crazy is that I'm even there meeting with him. But I would say within like half an hour, there's like a familiarity. And I, I can't believe this. And I'm like this literally geek, like pimples, 18 year old, and having this lunch with Steve Jobs. And I feel like we've known each other uh, for, for a very long time. So um, there is, and it's actually that day that Steve introduces me to meditation, but in a really, really unusual way. Um, so the, what the book does is it just tries to really accurately recreate experiences that start to become crazier and more mystical and harder to explain uh, and that lead to like really crazy questions like what actually happened that day that I met him? What, what is he really up to? What is he doing? Uh, there's all these things that don't make any sense. Um, well, and I, I can go into some later, I guess, if, if that's of interest, but um, so 
So the idea is that I'm not trying to set out to convince you that guess what, you know, Steve Jobs is really different or, you know, there's all these spiritual lessons. It's, it doesn't work that way. It, it actually, I'm sort of taking the idea almost from meditation that each of these chapters, it, it drops you right into the middle of an experience that actually happened and you're experiencing it in the present moment as it's happening. And my, my concept is um, that people just can make their own conclusions. And if they think it's all stupid, that's, that's totally fine. Uh, but it's like when you're talking about something spiritual or mystical, uh, even like regular language doesn't work. It's, and, and one of the other things that's interesting is that uh, mysteriously, I don't know how this happened, but every chapter in the book has a song that like perf that the song actually tells the story of the chapter, but in a completely different way. Uh, and there, and a lot of songs, there are songs that people are familiar with, songs that people haven't heard, but that's like another way of getting into it. So I guess um, that this is sort of my strategy for how to try to answer your question is to kind of give people an experience like the experience that I have, um, and then just see what they think about it. But your experience it, with him was a very spiritual teacher, mentor, very sort of aligned with your idea of love. No, <laughs> actually, I would say he was <laughs> not that at all. Um, he was a really, really difficult person. Uh, I mean, he could be, he did some things that were so kind and generous for me as, that I still can't believe. Um, but, um, I'll just to kind of give you a sense of what Steve was like. Um, after he was brutally thrown out of Apple um, and his whole reputation been destroyed, he started a new company called Next, which was a computer company making a workstation for higher education. And I would say Steve was at his least spiritual when he was at Next. Um, and it was really Steve's ego was just out of control beyond measure. Um, and so we had uh, invited Steve to introduce the next cube at the Boston Computer Society. Uh, it was like a November meeting that we were going to hold at Boston Symphony Hall uh, and have like uh, 2000 people. Uh, but we had, there's lots of guidelines and regulations for Boston Computer Society meetings because one of the basic things is this is not like a sales presentation. Uh, we're not marketing stuff like you know putting banners up and things like that it's not allowed so this turned into one of the greatest disasters that i had experienced at the computer society because they they basically his people broke every rule they were completely obnoxious they would just you know steamroll over stuff and and everyone was so stressed because he would keep mixing things because like the color of green was like not exactly the color of green that he wanted behind him um, and uh, I was so furious, I felt that it was so disrespectful that I, um, I had mentioned to the, their head of communications that I was considering writing a really negative article about Next based on what I experienced and what they're like to deal with as a company. So um, a few days later, I'm sitting at my desk and the receptionist of the Computer Society buzzes me and says, um, Jonathan, you have a phone call. Uh, it's uh, Steve Jobs. Um, and I, so I pick up the phone. I say, uh, hi, Steve. And he says, um, I hear you're not very happy with me, Jonathan. And I said, well, that's correct, Steve. Uh, you know, we had a really bad experience working with your company. And I just sort of reiterated some of the different things. To which Steve said, well, you know, Jonathan, you can be an anal retentive jerk sometimes. <laughs> now, this is, is this, like, this is like a moment of teaching. This is, this is like, this is so interesting because in that split second, I knew how like 99.9% .9 of like organization presidents like me or executives or anyone would respond to a comment like that 
the instant response would be, fuck you, and slam the, <laughs> the phone down. It's kind of like what's being asked for. But then I had a second thought. I'm like, wait a second. You can be an anal retentive jerk. I think that's a compliment. Coming from the most anal retentive jerk in the universe, I think, <laughs> I think you just got complimented. And all of a sudden, I just felt like relaxed. And then we just had this really friendly conversation. <laughs> and um, so that's sort of how things happen. Like on the physical level, this is unambi unambiguous. He's an absolute asshole. Uh, but on another level, no, he's like a very dear and precious teacher. Um, and I don't, I'm not saying that he's consciously like, oh, I'm going to do something Buddhist here. I think it's more like just his, he just does things from his being. He's him. Yeah. And I, Jonathan, I expect, as you describe this, that what's going to happen for me when I read the book is um, that I'm going to watch your journey, not Steve's. Um, it, uh, and that's what I'm fascinated with and interest, you know, interested in is it, your journey through this whole thing. Well, it, he, I knew yeah. him personally, and I don't know him personally, so. His is actually, they're very intertwined. And ultimately, um, my journey is really different from his, but he, but he sort of laid out all the guideposts uh, in the process. So it's, I think you'll find all of it interesting. Um, I mean, I think his, well, here's something actually, there's all these mysteries that like no one ever bothers to talk about, but they just kind of uh, mention. I don't know if you would know this, but do you know this book, um, Autobiography of a Yogi? Wonderful um, book. Yeah, so about this um, Indian Swami uh, who, I mean, talk about an old soul. He's, he describes that he was conscious in his mother's womb. He remembers being in his mother's womb and he, he remembers thinking that part of him was very excited to go out into the world, but the other part felt he doesn't belong here because he's a spirit. Um, so he comes out into the world um, knowing that there is a, a teacher in Kathmandu that he has to get to in order to get instructions for what he's supposed to do with his life. And at the age of five, he starts running away from home to try to get to Kathmandu and his brother and father keep kidnapping him and dragging him back. Um, but he like, you know, has this, this um, sense that everything has been laid out for him for his, for his life. Well, Steve Jobs, um, when he's 19, uh, decides that he needs to go to India to meet the guru that Ram Das, who is formerly Richard Alport met, um, who kind of enlightened him, uh, this guy named Neem Karoli Baba. And so Steve spends two years trying to raise money to get to India he finally gets to Neem Karoli Baba's village and Neem Karoli Baba has just died one week before Steve gets there. Uh, Steve then proceeds to become deathly ill and he gets dysentery and he almost dies. But in the place where he's recovering from dysentery in this room, uh, there's like nothing in the room except a copy of this book. And he starts reading this book and this book becomes the most influential book in Steve's entire life. No one can make any sense of this because the book is like magic tricks and, you know, all sorts of bizarre things. Like why would someone who's like such a rigorous scientific thinker even be interested in this? Um, so it turns out that this book was actually functioned as Steve Jobs' personal user manual. And he reread the book every single year of his life, religiously. He would reread it after each year had progressed. Um, now, here's one other interesting thing. Uh, so Yogananda was from India. He felt called to the United States. He introduced yoga uh, to the Western world. He was um, targeted by the FBI because he was running these huge lectures with like 5,000 women. And basically their husbands believed that he was all trying to use mind control to um, you know, make trouble for them. So he was actually forced out of the United States and sent home. 
But he eventually comes back and he settled, California kind of becomes his center and California is really, really important to him. Um, the last day of Yogananda's life, he is giving a lecture at a hotel in Los Angeles and partway through the lecture, Yogananda collapses and then dies at the hotel. That's in Los Angeles. What happens 12 months later in San Francisco is Steve Jobs is born. Any, uh, is that just a coincidence? <laughs> that Steve like, is so focused on this book. And everything. So uh, there's, I think you'll find his journey pretty interesting too. You know, I think A, I, that is one of my favorite books and Yogananda and Ram Dass are very <laughs> prominent in my life and very prominent teachers, as is sort of Shams, Tabrizi and Rumi, which when you're talking about your teacher relationship with Steve, it feels very much like sort of that Rumi, Shams, Tabriz sort of connection. And I know we're shortly out of time, but I think, you know, just wrapping things up and asking possibly one more question. In your life, have all of your teachers been really sort of difficult or have you had the teachers of love? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, in some way, I actually feel like every single relationship, every person that you connect with is a, is a teacher in some way. I really view every relationship as sacred. So, I mean, even if I'm like talking to a stranger, there's, there's something there. Um, yeah. It's something that I meant to have from that. I think it's recognition from soul to soul. You know, you, you stop and you talk to somebody in the supermarket. And, you know, I, I imagine there are angels dancing together uh, as we talk about, you know, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with you that every single thing that ha happened in our life, if one thing was changed, even a word, if one word was changed, we would be different. Yeah. Uh, uh, the concept that words are action, uh, you know, blew me away because I thought, gee, uh, but they are. And they create, Ray and I say, you know, if, if I had done one thing differently, I never would have ended up in Boston and us celebrating 47 years together. Oh, that's beautiful. It's, I think it's, I mean, I, whether it's an old soul resilience whatever it is but i think having the benefit of the awareness of love and all of the different ways that love shows up in our life is possibly one of the greatest gifts of sort of sitting together and with like-minded people where you just get to sit and talk about the miracles of love whether they are incredibly cruel and evil or if there are those soft care bear love tugs well there's something else that i've noticed um as a therapist uh I've had quite a few clients say to me, like, Jonathan, you're actually the first person who who gets me, like, who really listen and like, really, really understands and sees things from my point of view. Um, and I, uh, I'm starting to realize that my own experience of being marginalized, bullied, uh, torn down, whatever, because I'm such an odd person. <laughs> and people don't get me and they're threatened by me or whatever else. Uh, those chisel marks are actually, I think what has made me be a really good clinician for people who feel misunderstood and feel alone in the world. So it's it's weird that all of like this cruelty, it's, it like turns into something quite beautiful. Blossoms into love. Exactly. And to like then, and for people to have a kind of love in which they feel fully seen, and then, and then it's possible for movement to happen. Uh, so it's weird that uh, um, the stuff I've hated the most, I actually feel a lot of gratitude for now. The beauty of it. Well, we are out of time, gentlemen. Brian, any last questions or words from you? Oh, just, just that, uh, Jonathan, I think there's going to be a person in the future who reads your book every year. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. That's nice. And we hopefully will see your book soon. And, and yes. pl please, if you're willing, come back and continue. Yes, I think we have yes. way more discussion to go through. Yeah, I no, I love to, this is really uh, powerful for me because 
Um, most of what I've said today, I've never said to anyone. I've never thought about. Um, so you're really helping me to understand myself, which I'm very, very grateful for. Thank you. And it's such a blessing. And thank you for today. I really enjoyed it. And I had a lot of takeaways. So the next time we talk, I already have a list. <laughs> Great. Anytime. <I'm> game. <laughs> thank you thank so you. much. Lots of love. And we'll speak soon. Good. Bye-bye.